arrived at the coffee plantation, but look where it is. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> it's in the middle of the city. I don't know. Look at this. <laughs> it's going to be a fun day. It's very soft. So even for people who are used to drinking coffee, like with milk, this is going to be very easy to drink. And we're going to be brewing everything by hand, which is the old fashioned way to do it. And which is, I don't know, I think it's a bit more fun than a big industrial machine. Can Whoa, I, look at that. Uh, can I put a microphone on you or no? Yeah, 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 you can do that. So that sure. when you're, you're talking, uh, we'll record you and then we can use some of the, the things that you said. Yeah, I'll show you. Thank you. Yeah, I see that. What water temperature do you use? Right now I'm using 92 degrees uh, Celsius. That's probably under 200, I think, Fahrenheit. <coughs> We're going to be brewing and tasting so much stuff later on. This is you. You guys can smell this. I wish somebody grew up. So what are we drinking today? We're drinking some Colombian coffee. From this Ghana. is the mommy of us. She'll be happy. Freshly roasted. Okay, everybody. Wow. I'll show you the flavor. This is amazing. There's something to have a house up here. So do you like this? This is a coffee plantation. So the sweetness actually comes from the way you roast it. Coffee is very sweet naturally, but when people... He was telling us, that Ricardo was telling us that none of these buildings existed just eight years ago. And you see a couple of cranes there building some new ones. Where the coffee beans are dried. Ah, uh, you can see some of the ones on the left. Some beans in there drying. They don't change color until they're roasted. Start out kind of green or tan. Natural, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. What's that? It's like a tangerine. It's smell it, yeah. Oh, wow. It's so similar so to a tangerine, good. but that's no. very acid. That's not right yet. What is it? What is it? On będzie nam wszystko pokazywał. Yeah, like Coffee beans. Coffee beans. Coffee beans. Coffee beans. Cafe frijoles. Si. Po prostu by zmienić na zdjęcie, bo to jest na pokój. Porter robi tak, że się skupia na tobie, a tło tak fajnie robi takie, takie zmazane. I to trzeba fajnie zmienić. That's not Spanish. That's Polish. A little bit, a little bitter. He was rescued by the police after like two weeks. <coughs> so yeah, I had to live through all the violent times. Wow, banana. Cool. Banana. Before? No? Never. Nope. These little tiny guys are all coffee trees. Oh, wow. I have a little sheet here. We're not going to get very deep into this, but this is a sheet that shows the different array or varieties of coffee. And one of the things that I want to emphasize today is that 
coffee is not a commodity. What, what we do at Urbania or what people like specialty coffee shops do is we treat coffee different than it is treated as a commodity. So as a commodity, I mean, coffee is traded in a stock market. You guys might see the price. Coffee is one pound, one dollar per pound. You know, nobody cares where it comes from, what variety it is. But I hope that in some time it's gonna be treated more like wine. Like different kinds of grapes create different kinds of wines. And this is a little tree that shows all the different varieties of coffee. Most of the time people only see there's one or two varieties of coffee. If you guys have ever heard the term Arabica or Arabica, Arabica coffee, do you know what that is? Or Robusta coffee? Mm -hmm. So the two main families of coffee are Arabica and Robusta. Robusta is a tree that creates a lot of quantity of coffee. So the tree itself produces much more kilograms per tree, but it is less quality coffee. Robusta is the kind of coffee you get from Vietnam, from Brazil, which are the biggest coffee producers in the world. Arabica coffee is all the coffee that is in Colombia and most of the regions in Central America. So Arabica coffee tends to be a much higher quality. It's a softer coffee. It's the coffee you drank. It's the coffee you're gonna drink in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> was that an important call? Was that today? <laughs> my bad. Sorry, man. Sorry, buddy. That won't happen again. No. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, Arabica is all the coffee we grow in Colombia. That's why Colombia became famous for coffee in the world because Arabica coffee gives a much sweeter, much lighter, just much higher quality cup. So the trees we have all here in this farm are two subcategories of the Arabica category, the Arabica family, which are called Castillo and Caturra, most of them. The ones we have around here are mostly Castillo. So the first thing I want you guys to do is to come closer to the tree and see the actual coffee beans. Everybody can find their own tree. The coffee beans are these little guys. Cafe Frijoles. So I would like each and every one to pick out some, this is what we call cherry beans. Just pick out any one you like, and then I'll show you what the ripe ones look like, what the green ones look like. There's a lot of trees around you. Everybody pick your own. And then I'll show you a little bit of why picking out coffee is so important. They don't come off easy, you gotta pull on things. Can you hit these? Blue by, blue by color. Yeah. So, we're gonna talk a little bit about how coffee is harvested, how coffee is planted, how coffee is treated. So, the first step of coffee is to harvest the coffee. Coffee in Colombia is harvested 100% by hand. This means that every little grain you see has to be picked out and selected by hand. So imagine if you're a coffee grower, you have to walk around all this plantation and you have to harvest 100 kilos of coffee. You have to pick out one by one. And the thing is, you have to pick them out in the correct uh, maturity process in the correct ripeness process so what we see here would be a terrible selection of coffee because we have the green beans these are all under ripe these are all gonna taste very sour very acidic if anybody wants to take a bite out of this you're Bye. welcome to try oh, it's gonna good. taste <laughs> terrible so these are under ripe these are beginning to become ripe you see they become to turn red but they're not ripe yet so this is also gonna tend to give a very, a very bad cup of coffee. These are ripe, so this is the color we're looking for. So why I'm saying all this, oh sorry, and these are overripe. This is in the process of being actually rotten. So when you're a coffee grower and you have to select all these beans one by one, you have to make sure that each and every bean 
is the same color, the exact same color. If a coffee grower comes to us with a selection of these kinds of beans, I have to reject him. I have to, to say, sorry, your coffee is not going to be good quality. You need to throw away the green beans and you do, you have to do a better selection. So how many, so you're saying there's multiple harvests involved? There's one big harvest in the year. Mm -hmm. The harvest, depending on the area of the country, will last around a month. So these little grains, this is green, but in a week it's going to be red. So the way it works is you have to go over the plantation every single day during the harvest. Ah, okay. And every single day you pick up, you pick out just the right, the, the ripeness, right? So why is this important? And why am I talking about, about this? In Colombia, the coffee growers have a terrible quality of life. The, their economic system is terrible because it is based on quantity, not on quality. So the way it works is, the average Colombian coffee grower has less than one acre of land. That's what he lives from. Uh, in that acre of land, he's paid for quantity. So there are these things that we call collectives. Collectives are like a collective where people take their green coffee and the government is obliged to buy from them. So if you're a small coffee grower, you go to the collective and the government has to buy from you anything you take from, from them. But the government sets the price based on the stock market price of the coffee. This is driven by the main coffee buyers of the world, which are Starbucks and Nespresso. So as Starbucks creates a demand, they set the price for the Colombian Federation and the Colombian Federation translate that into the price they pay the coffee growers. So it's so cheap that sometimes a coffee grower has to spend more money in transportation and labor costs than the money he's receiving for a load of coffee. So most of the times they even let the coffee rot in the tree. It's more expensive just to pick it out. The way they try to balance this out is to make labor as efficient as possible. The way to make labor efficient is to cut the selection process. So if you're paying somebody to pick out 100 kilograms of coffee, the fastest way for him to do it is just go to the tree and pick out everything you want. Next tree, everything you want. Next tree, everything you want. And that's the way Colombian business is made. Colombian traditional coffee business is made, which is terrible because that's why the quality of the coffee we perceive is not very good. The actual Colombian coffee is good, but if the selection is not very good, then you don't have anything. So that's where companies like us come in. So what we tend to do in specialty coffee is we pay the producers and the coffee growers a higher price for a good selection. So for example, uh, a Colombian, the Colombian price right now, the, the government price, is around $200 for 125 kilos of green coffee. That is nothing, that's 250 pounds of coffee. And they pay $200 for that. And that's what they live off you know, they get two or three of those a year and that's what they live on. So the economics are terrible. What we try to do is we turn the business around and we tell the coffee growers, how much do you charge me for this type of coffee, for a very well selected cup of coffee? And then the producer has control and he will tell me, you know what, Ricardo, I have to charge you double. I have to charge you 50% more because it takes me more time. I have more labor costs and we say, okay, it's fine. So that's what we do in specialty, in specialty coffee. And that's why selection is such a, such a big part of coffee. Okay, the next step that happens after we select all our beans is called the depulping process. There's a machine that does it. We're gonna take a look into it a little later, but I wanna do it uh, with you guys just by hand. So the coffee itself, what we drink as coffee, is actually the seed inside this bean. So, mm, if anybody wants to wants to grab a seed, grab, grab a ripe cherry bean and give it a little taste. There's one here. Grab a red one, everybody. Take a bite. There's a seed inside. Be careful. Oh, they're soft. The seed, this is the seed. This is what is actually going to become a cherry bean. This is what you're going to see in all the coffee shops as a coffee bean after being the processed seed. and after being roasted. But what we actually use is the seed inside. Is the pulp good for anything? <coughs> it's used for composting traditionally. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but there's a new trend of something called cascara tea. Have you seen it around maybe? Mm. No? So cascara tea is we sun dry this and we make an infusion of it, like a fruit infusion. And it, it's not a tea. it's kind of sweet. Yeah, it's very sweet. Mm -hmm. It's very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. Does it taste like coffee? No. <laughs> Nothing like coffee, no. right? Completely different. So a little bit of background and then a, a little bit of history of coffee and is why did we decide we had to roast this? Where did that come from? So back in, I think it was around the 15th century in Ethiopia, there was this monk who had these goats and he had coffee trees around his house. He would see that the goats were eating the ripe cherry beans and the goats were kind of agitated. He said, my goats are crazy. It was the caffeine working on the goats. He didn't know that back then. So he took these cherry beans to the monastery, the closest monastery. Hey, this is diabolic. This is doing crazy, something crazy to my goats. And then the monks, they took this, they take a bite out of it and they say, there's no pulp here. There's nothing good for this. You know, you're thinking about a fruit. There's no fruit here. It's just a bit sweet, but nothing interesting. And they threw them in the fire. After they threw them in the fire, it started to burn. It started to caramelize and it started to, to, to smell like roasted coffee. And everybody was, you know, having this great new smell that nobody ever heard before. So then the monks started analyzing it and that's where roasting coffee comes from. And that evolved over the years to what we have today. So these are the cherry beans, um, just to get an idea. One of these comes with two cherry beans most of the time. There's a very rare kind <coughs> which has only one seed inside. When we have one seed, we call that a caracolito. A caracolito is actually a bare cup of coffee. It's very scarce. It's impossible to brew a batch of caracolito almost because you have to do a great selection and then take out the ones which have only one seed. Why is it better? Because it's more dense. So it's basically more full of flavor. Okay, so from here we go into the processing stage, which is basically after we harvest these pulps, what we do with them to... May the bird of paradise flap your nose. A cherry bean and then ripped it open. That part is called a depulping process. So the depulpers are these machines. These machines have um, like a piece of steel which takes the cherry beans and cuts them open. So that way the pulp goes to one side which is later composted and the seeds go to a different side. The seed is what I had in my hand. If you remember when I chew it, what I had in my hand, that goes to these sacks. There's different kinds of coffee processing. The one we're going to talk about mostly is called the washed process. So why is it called washed? Because those seeds have to be washed afterwards. When you sow the seed, it's very sticky. It has something we call a mucilage. A mucilage is where all the sugars from the fruit translate into the, into the coffee seed. So the first part is the depulping. Then, according to the process, we do a natural fermentation process. All these tanks and the coffee you see there is under fermentation process. If you can smell, it smells way different than coffee, than the trees, than the smells outside. That smell is natural fermentation. Everything, or mostly everything that tastes good in life has fermentation. Bread, wine, cheese, beer, you know, chocolate. So fermentation, what does is basically transforms the natural acids of the fruit into natural sugars. And that creates a much more complex flavor. So coffee is fermented just to obtain a better flavor of it. There's a lot of different ways of fermentation. Some people do it like this, which is in the open. Some people do it in the shade. Some people do it in the sun. Uh, some people do it for one day, two days, three days, just to get an idea that coffee growers are in charge of all this fermentation process. And what they decide to do with the fermentation is what eventually translates into a better or worse cup. One of the difficulties they face is, imagine if you're going into the trees and you do a harvest, for example, you do 20 kilos, you drop it in, afterwards you go the next day and you drop the same 20 kilos in, those two batches are gonna have different fermentation processes. And fermentation is very fast in coffee because coffee is very humid. So a fermentation of 24 hours is normal, 
<coughs> what you want to do is make everything ferment in the exact same moment. And that's one of the key points of why coffee growers have to hire extra help so they can harvest everything in one go. If you over ferment coffee, it becomes sour. It becomes sour, bitter, almost like vinegary. So one of the key parts of fermentation is controlling the temperature, the humidity, the amount of time it's in, it's in there, so it doesn't become uh, over fermented and it doesn't become vinegary. Okay, so after fermentation, we're gonna head down there. Let me ask a question, yes. the, that pulp is sweet. Yeah. When you talk about fermentation, I brew beer. Yeah. Has anybody ever tried to take that pulp and make beer? I have no idea, but it would be interesting. Yeah. I actually tried a fermentation a few days ago, which was in a closed tank. I put some beer yeast, yeast used to brew beer, to ferment my coffee with beer, and it became over fermented within one day. One day there were worms coming out of it. Oh, worms? <laughs> oh. So, uh, you know, it was usually a process that, that takes three, four days, and in one day with the yeast, with the aid of yeast, it just became over fermented. Okay. Well, in brewing beer, you, you have to. <coughs> get it up to like 165 degrees and exactly. hold it to kill all the bacteria. Then from that point, when you cool it down and you put the yeast in, total sanitation. Yeah. And this has a lot more natural sugars, a lot. I think actually that the, there's different steps in coffee. I think that the brewing part of coffee is very well established, very studied, and people know what to do with it. The roasting process as well, but the fermentation process and the natural part of process I think that's where the future of coffee is. Because what happened, let's say 10 years ago, is if you're a coffee roaster, say in Chicago, and you wanna buy local beans from a local grower in Colombia, you have no way of doing that. You have to go through the Federation, you know, there's a lot of violence, it's hard for you to come to the country, you don't have direct contact with the coffee growers, so you cannot give him any feedback of how the fermentation feels in the cup. So the market is very open now. And what's happening now is we see all the best coffee baristas and coffee roasters of the world are doing direct trade with the coffee growers. And what you do then is you establish like a rotating uh, relationship in which we can tell them today, hey, this harvest, we feel we can change this fermentation, do this, do that, and in one year we get new results. So all the work that's being done in coffee, all the innovation is being made by fermentation processes. Um, a milling machine, remember, the coffee was inside like a little shell, a little silver skin. So what this does inside is it takes the skin away. Mm -hmm. That's this part. Afterwards, it comes here, this whole mesh vibrates, and we separate coffee into three different uh, bean sizes. Mm -hmm. Coffee, there's a myth in which a bigger grain of coffee means a better uh, quality of coffee. That is a complete lie. It is not a, a general rule of thumb. What happens is, when we roast, we have to take account of the, uh, the, the bean size. But what we do is we separate into three sizes and roast each size independently. It's something similar to beef. If anybody has cooked with beef, you cannot cook a small piece of beef and a large piece of beef at the same time. You know, if you put them together, one of them is gonna be overcooked, the other one is gonna be undercooked. But if you take all the small ones, you can do a great thing. You take all the big ones, you can do a great thing. So roasting coffee is actually cooking coffee. So that's why we separate into sizes. Um, in Colombia, for some reason I can't understand, the exportation quality standard is met just by the size of the bean. So Colombia has always developed as a coffee exporting country based on quantity. So it's just to show the world we have great coffee, they show that by showing a big grain size, a, gray, um, a big uh, bean size. But it doesn't mean it's good, it doesn't mean it's bad, it's just a perception, you know, yeah, people are better fascinated. Better. Yeah, <laughs> people are fascinated by it, you know, it doesn't mean it. The Colombian export grade is the lowest size of our mesh. So we actually have two sizes above that in specialty coffee. And this is the standard for specialty. So just, just you know, the change of mind between commercial coffee and specialty. So, you were asking me why we do with this. This is going to compost as well. It's, just, it's natural, it's 100% organic. Uh, yeah, it just you compost, compost it here or yeah. sell it somewhere? Here, we compost it here, yeah, down there. We compost it together with, uh, with the pulp. 
the poll free takeaway. So after we select, this is our real roasting machine. Uh, this is an American machine. It comes from Detroit. It's a very high technology machine, basically because it works with infrared heat. So the way it works is, there's a drum inside that rotates. We drop the coffee from here. It has heat from underneath. And then as it's rotating, the heat distributes evenly. One of the key things about a roasting machine is that heat is not in direct contact with the beans. Beans have to be roasted in a certain way so that they develop inside, not only in the outside. And this machine has won lots of awards, lots of prizes just for that infrared technology. For you guys to get a, an idea of how this works is, this machine has, this is what we call a probe. The probe is inside here. Every single roast batch has to be looked at and smelled by the coffee roaster. We have no indication whatsoever of how the coffee is being roasted. This is all sensory. I like to emphasize a lot of this because roasting is an art. And roasting is the most difficult profession within the coffee industry. And this is why. Imagine you're roasting for you know one hour or two hours or even a complete shift, work shift and you have to smell every single batch and you have to determine how to cook it or when to cook it determine you know by your skill by your your sensory skills so i'm not a coffee roaster we're gonna roast some later it's not gonna be great it's not gonna be perfect it's just gonna be okay but we do have somebody who is a roaster who just dedicates himself to this this machine to get a bit of scale can roast up to 10 kilos of coffee that means Every 10 kilos of coffee we roast is different from the next. That's why we are a small batch roaster. That's what it's called. Why we do very small batches and why we don't have a huge machine is because it just gives a better quality control. So this is why when we start to hate Starbucks. If you guys have seen Starbucks coffee, it's very dark. You know, it's almost black in color. That is burned coffee. Why do they do that? Imagine, obviously, the scale of Starbucks. They cannot afford to have, you know, a well-paid guy uh, doing things by 10 kilo batches. They have huge machines, you know, 500, 1,000, 5,000 kilo machines, and they just turn it on, leave it for some time, turn it off, that's it. They have no control over things like this. They don't have a probe, they have no way to smell anything. So the only way they guarantee that they're cooking every bean is by turning it higher. What we talk about, uh, earlier about the, um, let's say the small pieces of beef. If somebody tells you, hey, you have 1,000 different cuts of beef from different parts around the world, and you have to guarantee that everything is, you know, um, homogeneous, the only thing you can do is you can burn it all and grind it all together. That's it. And every piece of beef, of beef lost, lost its identity. So that's what big scale roasters do. That's what huge companies do. And that's why your quality is so bad, because every coffee is different. What we try to do in specialty is, every single batch, we analyze its density, its humidity, its fermentation process, uh, where it came from, where it was uh, harvested, when it was harvested, and we take all that into account, and then we decide how to roast the coffee. So in our shops, in our customers, every 10 kilos is different from the next. We try it to be imperceptive, but we really try to treat coffee, you know, almost as it's like. Like we try to get the most out of every 10 kilos of coffee. Yeah. And that's what specialty roasting is about. Uh, when you mentioned earlier, you have to shake your beans so they all cool, so they cool. That's what we have here. So this is just a huge air blower. As coffee leaves, we open this valve. Coffee is dropped here, and this is just agitation mixed with air so the coffee can cool down easily. Basically, coffee is roasted at around 200 degrees Celsius. That's a very high temperature. Um, so we need for it to cool easily. Coffee is only assisted by heat in the beginning of the process. Then it starts to cook itself just by the friction and heat of the other beans uh, beside it. So we have to cool it in the same way, just by cutting out the, the friction. How often does, uh, during the process, a roaster test the probe. 
I mean, put the pull it out, look at it, say, okay, it needs okay, another so minute. That's needs a great question. So, a roasting batch, depending on the coffee's density and properties, can take between 12 and 15 minutes. Uh, the beginnings of the roasting process, they don't need a lot of wine, let's say. They only take about five or six minutes, which we don't do pretty much anything. But from then on, I would say every minute, until minute maybe number 10, and then on, about every 10 seconds. Oh, wow. 10 seconds can make or break a roast. Wow. It's very, very sensitive. I mean, we do different roast degrees for the preparations we make. So like for an espresso machine, we do a certain type of roast. For a filter machine, we do a different type of roast. And the difference is only 20 seconds. And it's a huge difference. So roasting is, that's why it's an art. That's why it's so difficult. Even experienced roasters, it happens all the time. They burn coffee all the time. You know, it's, yeah, it's very, very precise. Sell it to Starbucks. Yeah. What's exactly. this? <clears throat> this is a lamp. Wow. It turns on so you can see the color of the coffee. The only thing you know to do of how the coffee is being roasted is you see the color. As it goes darker, the color itself turns from brown to black. And you can smell it, so it's just to yeah, give neutral lighting so you can see what the color is like. A machine like this, how much does it cost? Uh, $40,000 maybe? Wow. In Detroit, and then you have to bring it to Colombia. Oh, yeah. And then you have to make yeah. special flooring for it. So and you need a building machine, so, so it's yeah. not cheap. Yeah. Sure. It's not cheap. Sure. Yeah. And you're saying Starbucks has bigger machines that are so similar to this? 100 times bigger. I mean, this is very small. <coughs> this is a craft scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like the big company, they will have. This is 10 kilo. The biggest company here in Medellin, actually, is like uh, 3,000 kilo. Wow. That's so 300 times this. And it just has an on off button. That's it. They burn coffee all the time. Yeah. So what's the temperature of that? It starts at around 200 Celsius. <coughs> then it'll drop. Because coffee is at atmosphere temperature, so coffee will go maybe to 140, and then it begins to increase as well, up to around 200, 180, 200. Questions on this part of roasting? Let's do some dripping. Let's do, let's do some roasting. I don't control the temperature. We can control the air pressure. We can control the airflow. We can control the amount of coffee that goes into the machine. All these variables, we combine them to create what we call a roasting curve. A roasting curve is basically to say how fast the machine is roasting coffee, how slow it is roasting coffee. And by different curves, we can determine which is the best way to treat each coffee. So for you to get an idea of how thorough this is and how important it is to us, when we get a free sample, or a new sample of coffee, somebody says, hey, roast my coffee. It's not just to put it in the machine. We create nine different roast curves for each specific coffee. And from those nine, we decide which one is the best for each coffee. And then we do micro adjustments. So this is a representation of the coffee roasting curve. I won't get into much detail, but it starts in 200. Temperature decreases as coffee uh, reaches temperature then it starts to bounce as coffee is roasted further basically what's happening is it is losing acidity it is losing sweetness but it is increasing in bitterness so we have to find just the right point where we have all the sweet a little bit of bitterness a little bit of acidity a little bit of sweetness if we take the roast a lot further which is burning coffee we will achieve more bitterness which is what we find in commercial grade coffees, we're gonna lose almost all acidity and we're gonna lose almost all sweetness. So we just try to find one spot in the middle. Where the coffee we sampled earlier, where would it fall on that? That would be just right here in the middle. That's a medium degree roast. Yeah, that's what we always try to do. Okay, who wants to roast some coffee? Who's up for it? I need a volunteer. <coughs> Excellent. Okay, so this is a miniature coffee roaster. 
this is <coughs> kind of funny to say, but it's the same thing. Hold the miniature. That is doing 10 kilos. This is going to do 100 grams. Okay? So the way it works is this thing is heated inside. The coffee drum is rotating. We're going to pour the coffee inside, and it's just going to be in direct contact. So we're going to control two things here. We're going to control the temperature. This is in Celsius. This is the amount of flame going underneath. This is going to increase the temperature. The temperature is a very slow variable. See, I turn it all the way up, and it hasn't increased yet. So we have to anticipate what we want to do with the rose. So I'm going to tell you just a few pointers of when to change the temperature. And at the end, you're going to decide when to cut the rose, when to finish the rose. Yeah. Well, we're going to be the volunteer, so probably yourself. Yeah. Put your finger so the slower the better. <laughs> So not necessarily. If you go too slow, it doesn't work. In coffee, we look for something that is called a crack. A crack is something similar to what happens with popcorn. A crack is the coffee losing its, all its humidity. So as humidity is getting warm, it creates steam inside the bean. And that steam wants to escape the bean. And the bean pops, so it makes a crack noise. If you go too slow, it doesn't crack. So you have to find the way. Basically, the louder the crack, the better the development of the coffee. So we just have to find a way to, to get a real crack. Okay, my volunteer. So, first step. This is a probe. This is just to measure all the amount of coffee. We're going to scale it. Bridget knows how you scale. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to need 100 grams of coffee for yours. There should be enough here. You can just put it here. Roasting process, do you hear the crack? Yeah, we do. I noticed that was one thing I heard when I was doing the jig yeah. about popcorn. Yeah. There's actually that like popcorn. It's kind of like pop popcorn, only it undergoes two cracks if you leave it long enough. So the first crack is humidity, the second crack is oils. When you see a Starbucks hopper, like the bean hopper itself, the beans look oily, right? They look black and oily. That's a second crack roast. That is beyond being burnt. And that's why it tastes, you know, like very bitter. Mm. So what we try to do is always achieve a first crack. If it doesn't achieve a first crack, it's probably undercooked. So it's gonna taste like very grassy, like cereal maybe. And then after the first crack, just by sight, we determine when we want to stop it. We never reach the second stage crack. That's just our personal preference. Dark coffees or like Italian coffees, they do reach second track uh, stages. But that's including the, the pipe, right? <coughs> no, this is scared out. Yeah, no, I'll try to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, let's bring that back. Okay, so. Take some out or no? No, that's fine. Alright, so first thing is, you're gonna put that probe in here. Don't put it all the way in, because it's gonna get jammed. Try to put it as straight as possible with a bit of an angle in this direction. Okay. And just do like, like wiggle it a little bit so all the coffee can okay. When you put it in, I'm going to start the timer. And, and then, then yeah, we'll yeah. go from there. Okay. It has to start at 200 or yeah. This one, because it's smaller and smaller quantity, I'm going to start at 185. Just a bit uh, sore. Yeah, so you start it almost. Yeah, and you find it a bit. And just wiggle, 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 wiggle. Ah. Softly. Okay, so you're gonna control this. It's around halfway. Okay, so I want to put it up. Uh, you want to leave it like that. See the temperature is going. Uh -huh. We're gonna wait for the bounce. The bounce is when you know this is getting colder because we put cold coffee in it. Okay. So 
right? It's gonna reach the same temperature at around maybe 140, and then it's gonna start to rise. Okay. When it starts to increase, you can crank it up a little bit, maybe to a number six. Okay. We're gonna hold for <laughs> around the perfect maybe eight or nine minutes total roast time. Okay. The first, I'd say around four minutes of roasting are very boring. We don't really get to see anything. What's happening is uh, the beans inside are just dehydrated. They're losing humidity, losing humidity. You don't see any difference, you don't smell anything. After the sixth or fifth minute, we can start to see some color changes. And the bean is gonna become kind of yellowish, and then it becomes increasingly brown. Okay, so that bounce, you can increase a little bit. And then with this switch, is for air, it's just an extraction. You can turn it on, it's gonna be a little loud, but don't worry. This is the pan. Oh wow, look at that one there. So put on the side of it. Now we can leave it there and for a while. That's just to extract all the gases. So that it's there and it makes everything there. So as coffee is being roasted, it creates CO2. CO2 has a very bitter flavor. It's natural CO2, of course, but it does give enough flavor. So if you don't take all those gases away, then you can take it. So our probe, the probe there, yeah, it's gonna be this time. Um, the hopper is rotating in this direction. Okay, this direction. So what we do is we take a spoon, let's improve the top, and then we can see it. Careful, it's hot. See, it's become a little bit yellow. Yeah. It's not as good as before. So that's going to taste hot. Okay. So the idea is for you to do this as the rolls is developing, and then by sight and smell, you can decide when to do it. Or it's not. Yeah. Yeah. No pressure. No. Oh. Zero. Don't worry. This has to be okay. It doesn't have to be. I prefer it to be because. If it's closed, every time I want to throw, I'm going to be changing the temperature. So it's, it can make it a bit unstable. So I just leave it, leave it, leave it open and just work it through that. Smoke it now. And it's also better to see it. So it's starting to smoke. Yeah. Temperature is increasing. It was at 4 minute mark. So you can see it's a bit much more yellow. When it turns from yellow to brown, that's when it's starting to go. That's when it comes out and then it comes out and then it comes out. A bit further down, but then when it's dehydrated, we can increase the power a little bit more. Uh, I'd say when we're around 165, maybe we can increase it to the number 8. So the right up there. And then it's going to be full power. <coughs> Hopefully, until before the first part. The ideal situation is we anticipate the first track and we lower the temperature completely to zero before it cracks, right before it cracks. So, so now it's going to be up, like it's going to break it up. Great. That's going to start to move really fast. See, it's been, yeah, you can go. It's been five minutes, not really much has happened. See, it's already brown. And then the next two minutes, everything is going to be really fast. So right now just be wary of the temperature. Uh, you can fold it 10 or 20 seconds. That's yeah, so you, I don't want it to go too over. You don't want it to go over 185 basically because the temperature will be really good. It's starting to smell. Yeah. You guys can see all the smell over. When it started to smoke, the smell was almost like the grass being burned. Now it's kind of starting to smell like Right before we take it out, this little beaver uh, is going to inject some air into the skin. Because as coffee is being cooked, little particles or particles are going to be around and they continue to grow. So right before we take it out, pull the lever and that blows air inside. You're going to hear the crack. Okay. Oh, that's a crack. So the motor is going to go I would do a little bit more and then you can turn it down. So that's more like more. Yeah. So that's like you know, one of the cracks before the other ones. Yeah. We want like a communal crack, let's say. Communal crack. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So now, all right, so it's at 185. Yeah, we can lower it down. Alright, that's correct. 
that's a lot of track. So now, the way to stop the machine is just is like, I think when you have a bit more track, you, know, you can lower a bit more the temperature because it has a lot of residual heat. Yeah. heat. Like after the first track, we usually do a run one minute, one minute and a half. Oh, still for keep track more? Yeah, you have to check it. So this is basically up to you. It's up to you. So I, so that one's very green, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we'll the bar. Yeah. So whenever you're ready to stop, that's entirely up to you. Okay. You take this and you pull it towards you, and the whole thing is going to incline, and then top is going to be gone. Okay. So it's okay. the temperature is still going up, so yeah. you can just let it go. Yeah. You can do some air right now, because there is no heat. Let's pull it. Yeah, just pull it. That's it. Okay. And now, it's the smoke and stop. So now, now it's up to you. Uh, you decide when to stop. I so now it's going to go down. You can pull the score. Yeah, it's going to go All the way. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's good. All right. Sure. Oh, do, I leave, do I leave it down like this? Leave it down there for the back there. Yeah. Dry those sugars within these are coffee beans so dry, drying in the sun, but actually they're still in the so shell. The is yeah. Kind of like then a pistachio, you crack open the and then shell and you get the bean. A much more expensive uh, cup, a much more I don't think I can do this one handed. Try. try. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And inside, that's the coffee bean in there. Like 600 pounds of this in the shell. But you can't about that a local 100 pounds of coffee. It holds up to 75, even 80 kilos of green coffee. This is how coffee is transported in the region. So imagine you're a coffee grower, you don't have a car, you don't even have a road because it's a rural area. You have to take 80 kilos, put, put it in your elbow, put it in your shoulders, mm -hmm. and go for it. So this is how it's been traditionally um, stored. What fiber is that? This is called fique. PK. PK. PK is only grown in Colombia, nowhere else in the world. Wow. There's something similar in Brazil or in India, but PK is exclusive to Colombia. Yeah. They make clothes out of that too? No. They make this and they make ropes as well, like natural fiber ropes. <coughs> so this bag, this is what's been used traditionally. This is what you see. However, it was made just for the capacity of loading, the loading capacity, not for keeping the quality of coffee. As I said, coffee is very absorbent. So coffee crumbs from two, three, four hours away and it has to undergo transportation. It's in a diesel truck, you know, it's prone to bacteria, humidity, mm -hmm. smokiness, everything. So what we do now with specialty coffee is, this is not as romantic, but it's very for quality, is we use these bags. These are called, yeah, they are called Grain Pro bags. They are a special FDA created plastic for coffee which is not absorbent, so it keeps the smells away and it protects coffee. Yeah. And then what we usually do is we put that bag inside of this one because mm -hmm. that bag is not meant for holding 70 kilos, it's meant for quality, so we put it inside this one and then coffee is traded around the country. That bag inside of this one or that bag like this we go inside one of these. This is the, um, let's say the modernization of this bag. So as you see, it's also woven. It's inspired by it, but it's made from plastic, from a synthetic, synthetic product. So this is also able to hold, like this, for example, is 62 kilos. If anybody wants to take a lift, you're welcome to try it. Love anybody it. for a workout? <laughs> no? Yeah. Are those bags expensive? Which ones? These bags that... That'll cost maybe 1,400 pesos. Can we have one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. When we're in Pacagenas and he's drunk, I gotta yeah, put yeah, him yeah. on my shoulders. <laughs> it has to be with coffee. It has to be with the 70 kilos. Yeah, Otherwise, it's no fun. Oh, you got that, right? Yeah, right? Put it there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's oh half a dollar. Basically. Half a dollar is not too. Do they last long? or do you, like, do they last forever. Do they well, last forever? Okay. I mean, they last but they last a long time. Yeah. They're actually very coveted because, you know, for coffee very growers... Very rough material. Their margins are so tight <coughs> that for them it's expensive. Yeah. You know, it affects. And it's half a dollar. One of these will cost seven times less, six times less. Yeah. Just oh, wow. because it's, it's lighter and it's plastic. Yeah, yeah, it's no and that's the Colombian colors. 
the middle. Ah, uh, that's just a coincidence. They do the middle. <laughs> <all that. laughs> That is so cool. I want to see this video. Can you get used to it? Yeah. It should be quite nice. That's what he's going to see. So everybody follow me for the pretend tour. <laughs> the pretend tour? <laughs> And it's gone. This is a model home that they're building. There's a long-term development and a commitment of uh, the developer to buy all the property. And the way it works is then they will um, uh, pay it off as they sell the apartments, as they're built and as they're sold. Then a, a lot, portion of those proceeds go back to the a uh, former landowner to pay the, for the property. This house on the plantation is over 100 years old. It was last rebottled 60 years ago. I'm gonna go inside and take a look around. It's quite fascinating. Everything grows here. This is where we did the coffee tasting. The size of the walls, how thick they are. Yeah. They're all made from compressed mud, basically. Oh. Yeah. He has said the walls and are so thick because they're made from they compressed so mud. It's lasted 100 uh, years. That's pretty wood. good mud. Here's some pictures of how it used to be. This is just history. Walking tour. That's what they had when I was in typing class in high school. high-rises in the background in 2004. Yeah. Corridor number 47. I uh, could understand most of that if I took the time, but... Thickness of the walls. Well, stumbling here. It's used as an event center now. Nobody lives here. They have weddings and different parties and things like that here. What a location. Is this the casino? Ooh, security monitor. Huh, I didn't notice any cameras. I'm slipping. Nice. <laughs> I 
Hola. Is this school or tour? I don't know, I'll ask. Bye, Just make sure you only do open. Like if you do this, really use this thing to. I'm never going to Starbucks again. <laughs> Excellent, man. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. That was his goal. Exactly. Kill Starbucks. I told you at the beginning, right? Yeah. Ricardo, is, yes? that a, is there a school out back? Uh, a school? What do you mean a school? Well, there's a lot of children out back at you. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're doing a tour? <laughs> just a tour of the, of the farm, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. They're in there, yeah. Everything's in there. French vanilla to the garbage. <laughs> <laughs>